This film is intended for eye surgeons for training and education purposes. Viewer discretion is strongly recommended. Hi, this is Dr. Deepak Meghur. Welcome to another video and in this episode I'll be sharing few practical tips on performing anterior vitrectomy in a case which has a transzonular vitreous prolapse. So let's begin. He is an elderly male patient who has sore exfoliation, a moderately dilating pupil. I'm expecting some amount of zonular weakness in this eye. He also has a uh, mature cataract which does not look uh, very hard. And uh, let's go through the case and uh, see when actually the problem begins. To prevent any intraoperative meiosis, I'm using BX device. The BX is in place and I'll come to know the zonular status only when I touch the anticapsule. And as I begin Rexis, I am relieved that the zonular health seems to be alright. So the one concern seems to be taken care of and uh, I'm hopeful that everything is going to be fine. Rexis is completed. It's about 5.5 mm, not an issue. Hydrodissection is done. The nucleus rotation is confirmed and we can see that the nucleus is very freely mobile. There's no evidence of any zonular weakness until now. Time to emulsify the nucleus. I am just speeding up the nucleus management because it was uh, uneventful. The nucleus is being managed by direct chop technique. The tip is buried and the nucleus is split into multiple small fragments using the vertical chop technique. And then each of these fragments are consumed at the level of the pupillary plane. There is a thick layer of uh, epinucleus. It is just irrigated with the BSS and then burped out using OVD. So far so good, time to aspirate the cortex. Some of the cortical fibers are quite sticky and sticking onto the posterior capsule and uh, it's taking a little bit of a time but I'm still not finding anything unusual. The bag seems to be holding on well. There is no evidence of zonular dehiscence as of now. The planned single piece uh, hydrophilic lens is being placed into the bag. I thought the job is done and it's time to close but life has got surprises packed in. As I was nudging the lens in place, there was a momentary glimpse of a bare area beyond the capsule bag and this position. Hmm, uh, that's unusual. So it deserves a second look. So I'm using, with the irrigation in my left hand, I'm using a Sinskyuk to just retract the iris in that quadrant and inspect what's actually wrong. Of course, and we can see this bare area beyond the capsular bag and you can see the capsular bag is wrinkled. The first diagnosis is obviously it's a 2 to 3 clock hour zonular dehiscence locally. But could it be a peripheral PC tear as well? Uh, my mind was having uh, this discussion at that point because the management strategies are going to be entirely different. If the diagnosis is only a dehiscence, you're going to use a CTR. But if it's a peripheral PC tear, then CTR insertion is going to be disastrous. So how do you differentiate that? So let's examine this area. So what we're seeing is just crumpled some capsular bag in that region. There is a lot of radiating lines both in the equator of the bag and some of them are even in the posterior capsule. So what I do is I just nudge the lens a little bit, dial it a little bit and if there is a posterior capsule tear, I expect it to enlarge when I dial this. The lens will decenter significantly more. I just go back, retract the iris and see it doesn't happen and at the same time I try to trace the one of the lines on the posterior capsule which is folding. And I'm just trying to see whether there is any discontinuity in any of the posterior capsule at any position. And it doesn't seem to be that. So my diagnosis of uh, a localized zonular dehiscence seems to be holding true as of now. So the next strategy is going to be introducing the CTR to support that area. So in these situations, inflating the bag with a cohesive OVD is definitely much better and safer so that the CTR has enough space within the capsule bag for it to be manipulated without causing much stress on the capsule bag. So a cohesive OVD is injected and a space is created in the capsular fornices. And because I want this area to be supported first, 
So I'm introducing the CTR in such a way that the area of the zonal adhesions is supported as the CTR is being threaded in rather than being pulled at. Please note that my second hand has the Sensky hook which is anchoring the CTR as it is being introduced into the bag. This helps us to prevent stress on the capsulorexis margin as well as on zonules. And when the last part of the CTR has to come into the bag, I ensure that this area of zonal adhesions is well supported. So I'm dialing the CTR to ensure that the area in question has got adequate support. So the CTR is in place now. Let us go and examine the capsular bag again. Whether the capsular bag which had displaced towards the center has it settled or not. And are we seeing those crumpled lines still? And thankfully the bag is now well supported. So diagnosis of uh, localized intraoperative zonal adhesions was right. So time to remove the OVD. I just want to go in and irrigate. And this time I see there's something fluttering in the pupillary area. Well, obviously it's our friend vitreous, which is showing its presence and it has prolapsed transzonularly. I'm using diluted transmesitate to just stay in the area so that I can identify the individual vitreous fibrils. I'm going to do the translimbal antivitrectomy to take care of this prolapsed antivitreous. The machine which is I'm using is a legion and it has got an electrical cutter. Please note the settings which I'm using here. I'm reduced the bottle height to about 80 centimeters, and these are my aspiration flow rate and vacuum, which are all kept in a linear mode, including the cutter. It is set to the maximum cut rate of 2000, but these are individual fibrils which I'm dealing with. So in these cases, I'm going to use the linear cut rate. As I approach the pupillary margin, you can literally hear the cut rate go down, as well as the flow rate in the vacuum. Now the idea is you don't want to cut the iris or the capsule. So as we are working very close to it, we want to work in a very low flow rate and low vacuum. And also the cut rate is lesser. So we don't uh, induce any inadvertent cuts to the other structures like the iris and the capsule. So one needs to have a lot of patience. I'm just switching the hands and trying to retract the iris and see to identify some more areas of prolapsed vitreous. And there is a few fibrils of vitreous coming from this end. As I'm working very close to the iris, you can see that the cut rate has gone down significantly. And I'm able to do the vitrectomy or cut the vitreous without catching the iris or the capsule underneath. So I'm having reasonably good control about over the vitrector. So two things are critical. We need to see well and second thing obviously is the patience. When we say that if the settings are set at linear, it means that the foot is going to control the amount of cuts which you're going to give. The longer the press, higher the cut rate and vice versa. As I'm trying to negotiate and remove one last bit of cortex, again the vitreous peeks in and it's quite tricky to disengage uh, this vitreous fibril from the aspiration port. I need to press the reflux button a couple of times before it disengages and then I remove the aspiration port. It is fabbed with the vitrectomy cutter and again the cutting begins. Once finally I feel that uh, there's no more transonular vitreous prolapsing out, I thought this is the time to remove the BX device. This time, I'm removing the BX device under the irrigation itself, not under OVD. It's disengaged and pulled out. So, this few surex foliation material along with the rough of the pupillary margin is floating up. Again, I use the vitrector to trim this. So, one can note that even though I'm working very close to the pupil, I've got enough control so that uh, I don't end up chewing up the iris. I want to recheck one more time using diluted tramson acetate. Because in eyes with transonular vitreous prolapse, you never know, it keeps on presenting itself. So I want to be very sure before I close the case. In this eye, I also decided to do a peripheral laridectomy because I'm not sure there could be a peripheral blob of vitreous and I don't want any pupillary block-like phenomenon. So I'm doing an, an laridectomy. These are the settings which you can see. The cut rate is set at least at a very low flow rate in vacuum and I'm using this in an IA cut mode. It's irrigation, aspiration and then cut mode. Give a single cut or an another cut and you can see a small, tiny, cute little aridectomy at 1 o'clock as I'm sitting temporarily. I'm just using the vitrectomy to do one last bit of anti-vitrectomy if at all there is any in the pupillary area. 
And once I'm certain the stromal hydration are done, intracranial antibiotics are placed, that's it, the case is done. So these are the first day post-op pictures. To summarize, in this case, we try to discuss two important things. Number one, in an eye which has got poor midriasis, it might be difficult or tricky to distinguish between a peripheral PC tear with an localized on dehiscence. Secondly, we try to understand how to use the vitrector settings to perform vitrectomy without damaging the iris pupil or the anticapsule and what settings would be ideal when we are working very close to these structures. Well, the message here is, I prefer to use the cut in a linear fashion when I'm working very close to these structures so that I can have control over the cut rate and also the vacuum and the flow rate are set to very low. So we don't have any uncontrolled uh, catching of the iris of the capsule. Of course, managing the vitreous which is prolapsed across the zonules is quite tricky from the anterior approach. Uh, another good option is always to go through the past pana region with the irrigation from the entry aspect. But again, that would take again an extra incision. And many a times these eyes are on topical anesthesia and uh, they might find it a little bit uncomfortable. We may have to augment the anesthesia. So these are situations where we can still try to do through the anterior limbal route and uh, be reasonably successful. So that was it. Thank you for watching and hope you found this helpful.